Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Zuckerberg's new plan asking the board to withdraw his proposal to create a new class of shares. A rare victory for outside investors in a battle for control of the world's largest social media company. What this means for Facebook shareholders next. Plus, the wheels for Uber's London operation could completely fall off. Regulators refuse to renew the startup's license in one of the most important markets. We'll map the road ahead and potential impact without its pool of 3.5 million customers. And Apple's latest line of next generation hardware hits markets worldwide. We will review the first official day of the iPhone 8. But first, to our lead. Facebook has scrapped plans to create a new class of shares. It's a rare victory for outside investors in a battle for control of the world's largest social media company. This comes just days before the social media giant CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, was due to testify in a Delaware courtroom. The new share class was intended to give Zuckerberg the ability to sell his stock without losing control of the company. Zuckerberg is also said to sell 35 to 75 million of his own shares over the next 18 months. That would total between 6 to 12 billion dollars. In a statement, the Facebook CEO said, quote, over the past year and a half, Facebook's business has performed well and the value of our stock has grown to the point that I can fully fund our philanthropy and retain voting control of Facebook for 20 years or more. As a result, I've asked our board to withdraw the proposal to reclassify our stock, and the board has agreed. Joining me now to discuss this, our guest host for the hour, Tech Economy CEO David Kirkpatrick, and with me here in San Francisco, Bloomberg Tech Sarah Fryer, who covers all things Facebook. So, astounding development. Astounding. Really. I mean, what's your reaction? Well, it's just it's just a funny conclusion because this has been such an embarrassing case for Facebook. Bloomberg reported in December on some texts behind the scenes between uh, Zuckerberg and board member Mark Andreessen. You reported on, on those I texts. I reported on those texts. <laughs> Let's be clear. Um, and and this is all coming at exactly the wrong time. Like Facebook is just in the crosshairs politically right now. It is not the right time for Zuckerberg to go on the stand to defend ultimate control of the company. And good thing he's rich enough that it doesn't matter, right? It, right? That's basically what he's saying in the statement is he is now rich enough that this is not even a thing that he has to worry about. David, money you know, what's your take on this? Obviously, we've been talking so much given what's been going on at Uber about founder control and how much is too much. You know, what's your take on Facebook and Zuckerberg's ultimate decision here? Well, I think Sarah called it exactly right. The timing was fantastic for shareholders and terrible for Zuckerberg. If he had gone on the stand and been interrogated by a lawyer who I understand is quite aggressive and has a lot of experience being very aggressive with corporate chieftains, it would have been an, a PR disaster almost without question because of the issues that are flying around right now and the fact that realistically quite a few of them could even be tied to this case because, you know, if the issue is governance at Facebook, and the governance is clearly not going that well at the moment. The argument for his return, you know, long-term control is not that strong. Uh, now, on the other hand, it's also super lucky for him that the stock has gone up so much. I mean, it's just, uh, it's a bizarre time for this company. The pace at which the, the, you know, frying pans have been flying at its head recently is just astonishing. So he said he'll be able to retain control for 20 years or more. What happens in 20 years? I think he might try it again then. I mean, it's so much can change. The thing that we've learned about Mark Zuckerberg this year, which is just reinforced every year, is that this person just is so dynamic. He's changing all the time. He's adapting to new situations. He, uh, as one of his uh, managers told me once, he like wakes up every day with amnesia and re-evaluates all the things going on and says, wait, how could I be doing this differently? And that is a really good thing to have in a leader. So, David, you know, talking about this Russia situation, of course, Facebook and, and you know, Mark Zuckerberg did a Facebook Live yesterday. Uh, he said Facebook would be turning over more information to Congress. They want Congress to decide how much information they reveal to the public. He also said they would completely revamp how political ads are displayed on Facebook. Uh, after this, President Trump tweeted, the Russia hoax continues. Now it's ads on Facebook. What about the totally biased and dishonest media coverage in favor of crooked Hillary? Uh, you, what do you make of this situation that Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg now find themselves in? Well, again, I'm agreeing with Sarah. I would say that, you know, her recent interview, so many in Business Week, the fact is, 
you know, he is an extraordinarily agile thinker and a very idealistic leader who nonetheless finds himself in an incredibly difficult situation, which, granted, is somewhat of his own making. Um, but, you know, that Facebook Live he did yesterday and the kind of amazing litany of things he promised to do was a turn. I mean, he's he continues to change and say, you know what, I'm going to take this more seriously. I mean, he started a year ago at Techonomy, my conference, saying it was a crazy idea that fake news affected things on, on, in the election. And now he's like not only turning over all these Russian uh, uh, ads to Congress, but he's really acknowledging it's not just in the U.S. It's in Germany. It's in a range of other countries. They have to basically start monitoring the, the nature of political advertising in every democratic country around the world, which is going to be expensive. The one thing that I really think is worth noting, and I'd actually be curious for Sarah's view on this, is I think they're going to have to do so much in response to all these concerns, it's going to start cutting into their profits. And, you know, they have had astonishing profitability because they really just haven't needed all the money that they keep, ro you know, ro rolling in. But they're going to start having to spend enormous amounts to stay ahead of this panoply of issues about speech on Facebook, I believe. I, I don't know that that's really going to be the thing to cut into their profits because, it, it, you know, this, it, it is expensive to deal with this, but there are some other factors that I think might have even a larger impact, like right now spending so much on, on video content for their new video watch product, that's going to lower their margins, sharing ad revenue on those videos with publishers. I mean, I think those... Those are like, you know, almost the more boring aspects of Facebook's business right now because we have all this political turmoil. But let's not forget, this company has done so extremely well and reaches more than half of the world's Internet-connected population that, you know, there may be some macro trends that, that will affect them more than these political trends. David? Well, but I'm curious, do you think, Sarah, that that means nonetheless their astonishing profitability is going to get affected one way or the other? Because that's the key question oh, yeah. with the stock performance we've seen. Well, yeah, I mean, I think definitely, but I also think this company continues to surprise us. I mean, remember when we were all so worried about whether they'd be able to monetize mobile ads and they figured that out. And and now they have so many irons in the fire, right? They have virtual reality, they have artificial intelligence, they have all of these things that they really just haven't monetized to their full extent, especially WhatsApp uh, and, and Messenger. And so this company is, it's been it's been a, a pretty predictable company uh, from a business standpoint for the last few years, but I think the next few years are just full of question marks on on the geopolitical scale, but also in terms of the business model and how it evolves. David, last question for you. You mentioned Sarah's remarkable interview with Mark Zuckerberg that was in Business Week, is in Business Week this week, where they talk about whether or not he's running for office. He says he's not. Do you think he ever will? I don't think he will, and certainly I would say he can't until he starts to fix some of these problems, and fixing them in some ways is almost impossible. Because if he were to run for political office, and the same is true of, uh, of Sheryl Sandberg also, it would draw attention to the reality that if Facebook chose to, it could effectively determine the outcome based on the control over the information flow for such a huge percentage of the electorate. That is not something he or she would want attention to be drawn to, to the degree that it would if they were ever to run for office. Therefore, I don't think he can run, even if he were to want to, which I don't think he does. All right, you've got a definitive answer there. Uh, David Kirkpatrick, Tech Economy CEO, you are sticking with me. Sarah Fryer of Bloomberg Tech, thanks so much for stopping by. All right, coming up, a major blow for Uber, how the company is responding to having its license revoked in London, what it means for competitors. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Now to a story we've been covering all day on Bloomberg, London is slamming the brakes on Uber. Regulators in the city are revoking its license to operate, adding to the list of controversies the ride-sharing company faces. The impact could be huge. Three and a half million people and 40,000 drivers use the app in the British capital. 
Bloomberg News obtained a staff memo from Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi where he says, quote, while the impulse may be to say that this is unfair, one of the lessons I've learned over time is that change comes from self-reflection. So it's worth examining here how we got here. The truth is that there is a high cost to a bad reputation, irrespective of whether we did everything that is being said about us in London today. And to be clear, I don't think we did. It really matters what people think of us. Here to wrap up the news and what it means for the world's most valuable startup, Gerard Gretsch, CEO of Tech City UK, a nonprofit that focuses on accelerating growth of the tech industry in the region. He joins us from London. In San Francisco, we've got Eric Newcomer, who covers all things Uber for Bloomberg, and still with us, our guest host, David Kirkpatrick, and CEO of Techonomy. So, Eric, first of all, you got this memo from Dara Khosrowshahi. What more did he say? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of a back and forth. Uh, the company's head of the region sent an email, you know, being mm -hmm. sort of saying everything Uber was doing to sort of respond to this. And I think Dara really just wanted to make the point, you know, there's a level of culpability. Even if we think we did the right things in London generally, you know, bad actions elsewhere in the country, elsewhere in the world, you know, have an impact on our reputation here. And we need to deal with that and acknowledge that. So it's a very different message than you would have heard under Travis Kalanick. How devastating a blow is this London situation? I mean, if they really have to leave the streets in London, it's terrible. I mean, it is one of their best cities in the world. Like, most cash flow generating, I mean, one, um, at least among, if not the most cash flow generating city. Now, there's a question whether they really have to leave. They're appealing the decision. But if they had to, it would be terrible for the company. Gerard, what is the immediate impact of and reaction to this news in London? Well, f right now, um, we're, we're seeing a petition being signed by hundreds of thousands of people. I think they've reached about 350,000 people uh, signing up this petition online. But I think what's really important to note is that the they're clearly appealing, and whilst they appeal the case, you know, Uber will continue to operate here in London. Uh, you know, uh, 3.5 million people use the app, so you can imagine that the appetite is very, very high. But this is not about the technology. What Transport for London, which is one of the most innovative uh, institutions when it comes to urban mobility, this is not about the technology or the innovation. This is about the conduct of the company in certain areas, like how do Uber drivers obtain uh, medical records, how do they report uh, offensive crime. So that's what's really interesting. And it's unfortunate that they've had to kind of come to this point uh, I would have hoped that they would have actually resolved this. But as I said, Uber will continue to operate uh, as it appeals this decision immediately. David, this may well be the most significant consequence of Uber's sort of high risk behavior. You know, what is your read? Well, I got to congratulate uh, Eric on getting that memo. And it is really refreshing to hear uh, an Uber employee CEO talking so candidly and realistically about the nature of business. We haven't really heard that kind of talk from Uber before. I mean, they seem to think business is something different from what the rest of us think about. I mean, one of your Bloomberg View columnists today talked about the pirate culture of Uber, which is what they have had. So I think they need to turn. And if this pushes them in the direction more of turning toward a more reasonable culture, that would be beneficial for the company long term. But they have a lot of things in, you know, skeletons in their closet that are yet to emerge. And I think some of them are going to be very awful. There are some things that have been reported that still are only beginning to be researched and, and in, investigated by government, like this thing the information revealed that was called hell, which is effectively uh, Ill, what would, would be, if proven, illegal corporate espionage against Lyft in the United States. And if that were to be proven, you know, governments all over the world are going to start thinking this way, and Uber's reputation is going to be harmed even further. But at least with the new CEO, they're starting to talk the way a reasonable, rational, long-term thinking company ought to think. Eric, there's hell, there's gray ball. Uh, how many more skeletons does Uber have in its closet? Right, there are three Department of Justice probes. I mean, we revealed it a lot about their Foreign Corrupt Practices Act problems and you know that they're, the company's investigating China, Malaysia activity in Indonesia, South Korea. So they're, they're, there's a pretty global look at whether they bribed officials in any of those countries. And I think there's a lot we're still going to learn about and I'm still digging into. So I think it's going to take some time for Dara Khosrow Shahi to put the old company behind him. And I think to some degree it's going to have to be that was an old Uber. but 
you know, how much they're still embracing the old Uber will, will play a part. Meantime, Gerard, we've been looking at this timeline of Uber's difficulties across Europe, whether it's London or France or Germany or the Netherlands or Denmark. They have had run-ins with the government in all of these places. You know, what is the impact sort of across the region of these choices that Uber has decided to make over the years? Well, I think London was one of the first uh, cities in the world outside the U.S. to adopt the technology and uh, it, it's reached a, a point where 3.5 million people are using the app so it's been very well received it's a great application but there is obviously a lot of competition out there you know my taxi cabby uh, the black cabs themselves have actually introduced credit card systems into their cars finally so that's a, been a positive move uh, so I think but you'll get a lot I think you'll see a lot of grumpy uh, customers if it's totally wiped out which I don't think I hope that won't be the case I think, as uh, my fellow uh, colleagues uh, in, in, in New York and in, in the U.S. are saying just now, you know, let's hope that you know this is uh, Uber will appeal this and it will continue to operate. And I just hope that uh, they'll come to some sort of uh, conclusion which will enable Uber to continue operating. You mentioned the black cabs. How much of a dent has Uber actually made in the historic London black cab business? I mean, I think I think they've been impacted. They've clearly felt uh, the impact themselves, and there's been many uh, protests in the streets. Uh, uh, nothing violent, uh, but actually, it's been it's been uh, uh, there have been sort of been on the streets a number of times. And Transport for London has been really trying to work this out. I think, you know, if you look at Transport for London, uh, it was one of the first uh, uh, urban mobility institutions in the world to actually open up its data sets and its APIs to allow you know, app developers to develop services on the back of the data being opened up. So they're very innovative. They're very forward-looking when it comes to technology. And I think here, as we've been talking about, this is, they're really questioning the conduct of the company in, con in connection with two or three things. So I would hope, again, I would hope that uh, uh, Uber and the Transport for London will, will resolve this over time. Uh, and and we'll continue seeing Uber on London streets. So, Eric, what is the appeals process as far as we know? How long could it take? Yeah, I, I, it's not exactly clear. I think, you know, it'll take time for it to play out and sort of see. I mean, the mayor's response here has been very interesting. I mean, there's... The mayor supported the... Right, and came out quickly, London I think, department. with an op-ed, sort of very, uh, sort of as soon as this came out. Uh, but the political ramifications, I think, will be super interesting. I think Uber's yep. really going to emphasize that they have this immigrant base of drivers, sort of a sympathetic base. And I think there are larger sort of issues at play in London about sort of, you know, the class of the black car driver uh, versus sort of the immigrant class of the Uber driver. And I think sort of playing up that debate is going to be to Uber's advantage in terms of saying, look, we have all these... You know, people who need this job working for us, and you're really going to throw them out on the, the street. David, final thought, 30 seconds. Well, if I were Lyft, I'd be working really hard to launch there so you, I could take those drivers and start having them work for me because that's a company that has a much better reputation. All right. David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy, you're sticking with me. Eric Newcomer, our Uber reporter, thank you. Gerard thank you. Getch, thank you for joining us on this evening in London. We appreciate you coming in to the studio. Coming up later in the show, Amazon delivery isn't just for books or groceries. How the online retail giant wants to bring you food from some of your favorite restaurants. This is Bloomberg. Some headlines grabbing our attention. Job cuts are on the way at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. According to people familiar with the matter, HPE will eliminate about 10% of its staff. That's at least 5,000 employees. This comes as part of CEO Meg Whitman's effort to reduce costs in the face of tougher competition. Walmart's online merchant, Jet.com, has thrown the first official blow as the holiday price war gets off to an early start. It's offering 5% cash back on orders made before October 29th that can be applied to holiday purchases. Shoppers can earn up to $50 in so-called Jet Cash that can be redeemed on the site starting November 13th. Sales for the upcoming holiday season are expected to surpass $1 trillion. 
Meantime, Taiwanese mobile device manufacturer HTC is riding high since the announcement of a deal with Google, shares soaring as much as 10 percent. The smartphone maker is now rated by by five analysts tracked by Bloomberg, up from three before the deal. Coming up, people were lining up to get their hands on the new iPhone 8, but will lukewarm reviews of the device impact overall sales? We will discuss. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. And a feature I'd like to bring to your attention, our interactive TV function. You can find it at TV Go on the Bloomberg. You can watch us live. If you miss an interview, you can go back to it. You can send our producers a message, play with the charts that we bring you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's begin with a check of first word news. The U.S. federal government reportedly told election officials in 21 states that hackers targeted their systems last year. That's according to the Associated Press, which also reports in most cases the systems were not breached. Many of the states have been unaware until notified Friday by the Department of Homeland Security. Mexican authorities have raised the death toll from Tuesday's earthquake to 293. 155 people are confirmed dead in Mexico City. Officials say the numbers of casualties remain unchanged for now across the country. John McCain said he'll vote against the Graham-Cassidy Obamacare repeal proposal. He becomes the second Republican, along with Kentucky's Rand Paul, to oppose the measure. A kindergarten fight. That's how Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov describes the war of words between President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Lavrov says the world should take a, quote, reasonable and not the emotional approach toward North Korea. The International Atomic Energy Agency has officially adopted a resolution condemning North Korea's pursuit of nuclear weapons. The draft was agreed on by the U.S., Russia and China before it was presented to conference delegates. Today, this conference reiterates its firm stance against the DPRK's possession of nuclear weapons and underscores that the DPRK should not harbor any illusions that its illicit pursuit of nuclear weapons will ever achieve legitimacy in the eyes of the international community. Ambassador Champagne also called for, quote, enhanced pressure on Pyongyang. Iran State TV has aired footage purportedly showing a medium-range ballistic missile being fired. Tehran hasn't mentioned the time or location of the test. It's a direct challenge to President Trump, who in August signed a bill imposing mandatory penalties on entities involved in Iran's missile program and individuals that do business with them. British Prime Minister Theresa May has laid out the plan for a two-year Brexit transition. May said neither the UK nor the EU would be completely ready to implement all the arrangements for Brexit when the UK formally leaves in March of 2019. If we get the spirit of this partnership right, then at the end of this process, we will find that we are able to resolve the issues where we disagree respectfully and quickly. Prime Minister May promised that the UK would live up to its budget commitments as long as it's in the European Union. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg.
It is a big day for Apple. The iPhone 8 and 8 Plus available in stores across the world. Folks lined up to get their hands on the new device. But so far, we've heard that reviews for the new gadgets have been lackluster, including everything from the design to the price point compared to rival models. Here to break it all down, we're joined by Bloomberg Tech's Alex Webb and David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy, is still with us. So, Alex, how did today go for Apple? It's hard to tell, really, because um, increasingly over the past few years, we've seen that more and more people are able to order online. The upgrade program, which means you get a new phone every year, means you don't need to wait in line anymore. So the significance of the queue, by Apple's own admission as well, has diminished. Nonetheless, in places like New York, there were quite big queues around the corner. Suggest there is a still a certain amount of appetite for Apple devices. And of course, perhaps the price point of the iPhone 10 coming in November has persuaded some people they don't need it. So, you know, what is the take on, you know, how many people will buy the iPhone 8 versus the 10? You know, given that the 10 is such a, you know, significant design overhaul and it's it's the one you want. Uh, this is the thing where <laughs> short queues don't necessarily mean bad news for Apple. Yeah. Um, I haven't actually seen myself any forecast on what the mix might be. It's one of the things that makes it very hard to tell. Apple doesn't break down how many of each model it sells. And because we're going to see a lot of the iPhone 8 demand fr front loaded into um, this fourth quarter, the third calendar quarter, which ends at the end of September, and then the iPhone 10 sales will come in the next fiscal quarter. It is going to be very hard to sort of um, work out exactly who is buying what. We will see the average sales price probably then jump in the next quarter from the current one, which might give some indication. David, you were with us the day that Apple unveiled these new phones. Curious what you think about Apple's change in strategy here. You know, it used to be there was only one iPhone. You could get a couple different colors, but that was it. Now you've got three different models, actually more if you count the cheaper phones. You know, you know, is this going to be a good strategy? Well, you know, there's so many possibilities. You know, we can't really, you know, look inside Tim Cook's head, unfortunately. But what Alex, Alex was just talking, and I was wondering to myself, could this iPhone 8 thing be sort of a kind of a feint in the sense that we know the 10 is going to be very hard to manufacture. It could be that they're worried about their ability to make enough to meet demand, and they're sort of by coming out with the eight at the same time or just a few months earlier they're sort of sort of bleeding off a certain number of users so they can have more time to build this more complex device that they ultimately want to make their flagship phone of course and which any of us who want, would be the kind of people who stand in line, presumably, would stand in line for. Uh, if I were somebody who's the kind of person who gets up in the middle of the night and stands in line in an Apple store, I'm not going to do it for a phone that's going to be out of date in two months. So, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense that there's not a lot of lines today. But clearly, the test for Apple is going to be what happens with the 10. We've been desperate for any information on what's going on in the supply chain, Alex. Do you think there could be any water to David's theory? Yes, potentially. I think if you look, what's going to be interesting is when we actually get under the hood of the iPhone 10. You talk about um, they have these um, teardowns, which a lot of companies do, and they get into the device, and you can pick out all the components and have a good sense of how much it costs to put together in terms of those components. Some people have been estimating this already, and it seems the iPhone 10 is considerably more expensive to make than the iPhone 8. So as much as it's considerably more expensive to, for the consumer, it may be that Apple's not getting that much more profit from the device itself. Hmm. That might then speak to the fact that Apple may in some way be preparing to sell the iPhone 8. The flip side to that equation, of course, is then services. Apple might be able to sell more services through the iPhone 10 because it's got a lot smarter things in terms of augmented reality and what it's able to do on that front. So there are a lot of balls that Apple's having to juggle here. And you wonder, will there be an iPhone 9? You know, what is their plan for, you know, their statement from 8 to 10? So is there going to be something in the middle? I, I, who, who am I to predict? We need Mark for that. Um, I, I did hear actually a very funny joke the other day. Someone said, is it the, you've got to be consistent. It's either the one phone 10 or the iPhone X in the Latin. <laughs> taxonomy. <laughs> um, you know, David, uh, on that note, uh, obviously the, the, the sales strategy ha it has been evolving. It takes a Brit to figure that out, by the way. Go on. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe Apple's trying to buy themselves some time right now, but right now they've got, you know, three different models that, that are going to be hitting the market. So, you know, I, I wonder if for consumers it's just, it, it, is it a little bit confusing, especially given all of the competing products out there? Or is this maybe just, is this really sort of an, an, a moment of evolution and next, next cycle will be completely different? 
I think it is confusing for consumers, but let's remember Apple actually does have a fairly significant competitor in Samsung that has done a very good job advancing its own technology. They had to come out with a really cutting edge high tech phone like the 10 uh, and they have to succeed with it because even though they still are the kind of premier provider and the high price, high margin company, uh, they've got somebody that's actually executing really well, sneaking kind of not going up their tailpipe necessarily, but definitely keeping close behind. And I would say if they were to really slip with their supply chain abilities or their design, you know, Samsung could surpass them in terms of the, the image of who makes the best phones, you know, globally and who makes the, the most desirable phones. So they've got to do well with the 10. They, you know, no matter what the margins are, they had to come out with that phone. But I think this question of whether the eight is maybe a, a sort of mixed blessing for them that even if it if it if, if it takes some customers away from the 10 that's a good thing is a very interesting question for several reasons both of which we've discussed here mm. There's one really, the big word in all of this is OLED. OLED, OLED, mm. OLED. This is the screen which is in the iPhone 10. And crucially, Samsung's Samsung Display, technically a separate company, but very closely related to Samsung Electric Electronics, controls most of the supply right. there. That's going to change over the next year or 18 months. And the extent to which it does and the pace at which that happens will really speak to Apple's ability to roll out products with this new technology. Before you go, I want to ask you about the issues with the other products. I mean, reviewers have talked about issues with the watch and the cellular connection and uh, uh, the, the, the TV set-top box, how, how serious I mean, it, it seems the watch stuff really is a software fix. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you've ever gone into a store where you've previously logged onto the Wi-Fi and then you've actually got to go in and sign in again. Um, you know, that's the problem with the watch at the moment. It seems probably quite easy to fix. Yeah. With the TV, that seems to be more of a cost issue, that there are other people who have 4K and HDR and all those things, and their devices are a lot cheaper. But that's the classic Apple issue. It hasn't necessarily stopped people from buying Apple products in the past. All right, Alex Webb, our Bloomberg Tech reporter who covers Apple. Thank you so much. David Kirkpatrick, you're sticking with me. All right, coming up, John McAfee, CEO of MGT Capital and founder of the McAfee Antivirus Company, sat down exclusively with Bloomberg at the Blockchain Global Summit in Hong Kong. What he has to say about China's recent crackdown on cryptocurrencies, that is next. And this weekend on Bloomberg TV, we bring you our best interviews from the week, including highlights from the Bloomberg Global Business Forum, including my exclusive conversation with Alibaba founder Jack Ma on competition with Amazon. Tune in this Saturday for the best of Bloomberg technology. This is Bloomberg. Singapore has risen to the top of an infamous list. It is being called the top spot to launch global cyber attacks. This according to Israeli data security firm whose software tracks an average of 8 to 10 million live cyber attacks daily. The city state recently stepped up efforts to tighten cybersecurity after several high profile attacks on government agencies and companies. In May, Singapore stopped most of its public servants from accessing the internet from their work computers. Well, John McAfee, founder of the antivirus software company and current head of Bitcoin, a Bitcoin mining company, says China's banning of initial coin offerings won't halt the global momentum of cryptocurrencies. In fact, McAfee sees Bitcoin soaring fivefold within a year to 20,000 per coin. Bloomberg's chief North Asia correspondent Steve Engel sat down with McAfee at the Blockchain Global Summit in Hong Kong and asked about China's recent crackdown. Take a listen. Within China, everything is extremely uncertain. Any officer of any uh, cryptocurrency exchange in China may not leave. Okay? They're not being arrested at the airport, but they've been told privately that they should stay in Beijing. The rest of the world is in chaos, of course, because no one, no one knows what's coming next. I mean, are they going to ban mining? That would be extremely disruptive uh, to the, to the uh, Chinese economy and to the world. A lot of the Bitcoin mines globally are in China. Well, the largest is in China. Yeah. Right. Uh, owned by, by Ji Hong Wu, you know, uh, 
tens of thousands of machines mining 24 hours a day. Uh, and those coins are staying in China. So uh, I do not think that will happen. And, and I truly believe that the Chinese government is a very rational government and in the long run uh, will come back and, and legalize ICOs with certain uh, legislative restraints uh, that will legalize exchanges again with, with controls. Because what's happened, people have taken advantage of China. Uh, people would come over and do ICOs in China promising a thousand percent return in a week. Okay? Oh, please, you can't do that. Uh, and, and so it was making everybody look bad. So I think in the long run, it's very good for the cryptocurrency community. But do you think there will be too much regulation? Are more governments going to over-regulate and crack down? Because you've heard all the arguments. There's no intrinsic of value, of course, et cetera, of et cetera. Yeah, well, of course they will. But th this will be a seesaw effect. Because when legislation is enacted, people will, will get around it. This, we're talking about a decentralized world, a decentralized process where peer-to-peer -peer activity is common. You cannot legislate that. Well, you can, but then how are you going to enforce it? You'd have to have an enforcer in everybody's home. Well, we can't do that. So, so yes, they will enact legislation. People will get around it. More legislation will be enacted. People will get around it. But in the end, governments will lose because the power of this technology supersedes and is way above the power of centralized government. Now, I know you're on record as saying you expect significantly higher prices. We saw this dip after the China crackdown, right. but it's already coming back It's already back come up. back to 4,000. Okay, it was at 4,000, and it was not just China. It, it was uh, Jamie Demon of uh, J.P. Morgan. Well, he who called said it, it a, a, a fraud. fraud. Right? Well, I went on right after him and said, please, sir, wake up. Which is the fraud? Because it cost me, it cost my company, over $1,000 to create a Bitcoin. And what does it cost to create a $100 bill? Please, uh, you're going to be 20000 Do you see Hong Kong playing a significant role now that China is not necessarily uh, playing in the game at this point? Hong Kong, a lot of cryptocurrency companies have started up here. Well, here's the problem with Hong Kong. It is still legally part of China, all right? And while China has had difficulty integrating it, if they choose, they could step here and, and collect me and everybody here. So I think Hong Kong, too close to China. You know, I think we need Switzerland, India, uh, the Philippines, you know, reasonable places. Um, the world is a large place. John McAfee there, MGT Capital CEO and founder of the McAfee Antivirus Company, and Bloomberg's Stephen Engel. All right, the U.S. International Trade Commission has determined cheap imports are hurting solar manufacturers. The decision could push up prices for cells and panels, but cut demand for solar projects in the $29 billion industry. It's now up to President Trump to decide if tariffs or quotas on imports should be imposed. Some analysts say imposing tariffs could cost U.S. taxpayers about $1.2 billion. Coming up, have you been dying to get Shake Shack and Chipotle delivered directly to your home? Well, Amazon is trying to make that a reality. Next, this is Bloomberg. <coughs> A story we will be monitoring. Google now has less than a week to meet a European Union deadline in an antitrust case. The company has been ordered to stop illegal conduct in the way it displays shopping results in search. EU Competition Commissioner Margaret Vestager says if comparative shopping search engines are unhappy with the Google remedy, the EU will start investigating. Google already faces a record $2.7 billion fine. Well, Amazon may soon be bringing Chipotle burritos and Shake Shack burgers to your door. The e-commerce giant has been trying to get into the food delivery business for a decade. Now Amazon has teamed up with a company called Olo, which provides digital order and pay technology to 200 restaurant brands with 40,000 locations in the U.S. Joining me now to discuss Bloomberg's Olivia Zaleski, as well as our guest host for the hour, David Kirkpatrick, CEO of Techonomy. So, Olivia, at the risk of offending the West Coast in and out crowd, when can I get Shake Shack? delivered. Starting very, very soon, they're going to integrate 
over 200 or about 200 restaurants, many of them really big name brands like Chipotle, like Applebee's into the platform so that Amazon restaurants can now offer food from those big brands. And this is significant because Amazon restaurants has traditionally really focused on these mom and pop relationships. So like the small neighborhood bistro that you like to go to with your family. And it's much harder to really make money on those restaurants. And it takes a lot of time and energy for Amazon to go out and acquire those restaurant customers. And Amazon has been experimenting with this in Seattle, right? In Seattle How and San Francisco. How have those experiments gone? So it's a very, very tricky business. We understand that um, the average food delivery can go any can cost Amazon anywhere up to ten dollars a meal, um, and it, the margins are slim on this business. So. It, by stepping into these larger brands, it's a big move for them. It really solidifies their ambition to have as many customer touch points as possible. Amazon wants to be in our phone, be in our daily life in as many ways as possible. And this is just another way for them to get a piece of the $1.5 trillion U.S. food market. And obviously, David, there's a lot of competition in this market, and especially in food delivery, you know, Seamless, for example, a huge competitor where you are in New York. What is your, how optimistic are you that Amazon can really succeed here? First of all, I wish there was an In-N-Out burger around the corner from my <laughs> office like the Shake Shack, but I'm very optimistic about Amazon's ability for better or for worse, to do almost anything because their motives are not the same as any other company. As Olivia points out, you know, they, they're doing this even though they're losing money. Obviously, it's a developing business, but in Amazon's case, as long as they accumulate the right kind of data, they actually, in some businesses, may not care whether they make a profit at all, not to mention the way that investors are willing to give them the benefit of the doubt even when they're not profitable. But the fact is, you know, they can do more and more stuff the more stuff they do because they get more variety of data that they integrate and they build profiles about us. They can anticipate other things we're going to want to spend money on and then offer that to us. They play a very, very long game, and it's all based on data. Olivia, Alibaba, interestingly, an interesting comp, you know, Alibaba's been getting into groceries, Amazon's getting into groceries. There are some interesting parallels, but Alibaba actually sold its food delivery business to Baidu. Is there anything Amazon should learn from that? Well, obviously it didn't work for them in that case, and maybe they didn't want to play this long game that Amazon is willing to play. And so I think what we can see here is that Amazon is committed to making something really work in food. We, we're seeing it with Whole Foods, we're seeing it with this Amazon Go concept that they have where you don't even have a checkout counter, you actually walk in, you, you take something off the shelf and uh, you can walk right out of the store. They are putting a, an enormous amount of resources into this. I don't see them selling any businesses off to a competitor anytime soon. Now that we're a few weeks into the Whole Foods acquisition, how is it going? Give us an update. It's going very well. We wrote some stories recently um, that foot traffic had actually increased in Whole Foods locations as well as online. And I think what we can learn here is that by purchasing Whole Foods, which has sort of done a very good job of building a lot of trust with consumers, Amazon now is able to take that um, that natural trust that people have when they go into a Whole Foods and they feel like they're buying an organic, uh, perfect banana, and maybe they can feel the same way when they purchase something online now. And it's been very difficult for companies to sell food and food products online. That's always been challenging. Right. So I think we're on the right on the precipice of a big shift in consumer behavior. All right, David, you get the last word here. This as Amazon is looking for a second city uh, in the U.S. to uh, locate a new headquarters. New York could be among among the top contenders. Um, you should know, uh, where is Amazon in five years? Where are they physically? I mean, aside from being in Brooklyn, no, which where is are they in general? Hope? Well, <laughs> yes. I, I think Amazon will be an even bigger colossus in five years. Although I do think if you add up all the stories we're hearing about Uber and Facebook, and you know, Amazon is going to become subject to some of the same forces that Uber and Facebook are becoming subject to, even though each company's story is different. Sheer scale is going to become suspect uh, for good reason, because these companies, you know, if they are based on data, they, they arguably are going to have more data than they really deserve to have. That's going to increase governments, and I think it's going to cause a, a different re relationship between these companies and the regulatory authorities. So we're going to see a bigger Amazon, but it's going to have to be treading more carefully and will be required to do so by government all over the world. I'm all certain right. of that.
Okay, David Kirkpatrick, our guest host for the hour and CEO of Techonomy. Thank you, as always, for stopping Thanks. by. Olivia Zaleski, who covers Amazon for us. Thank you as well. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. As a reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter, of course. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now from San Francisco. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody. We will see you on Monday.